It's just great to have the guru of love um, in our midst. He, is, he has a direct line, I think, to Cupid, and all your questions will be answered. You're just going to go home so clear. Tell us how the column came about and how it works, like what the routine is in terms of the submissions. I thought that the column should be open to anybody to write. And I was mostly alone in this opinion, actually. And I said, can we have an, an email address that says, you know, modernlove at nytimes.com and anyone could send in. And um, the idea was we would have to commission most of the work and that, to me, is a very difficult prospect <laughs> and, and hard because the stuff comes in and it may not be in good, and then you've got to deal with that problem. And I said, let's open it up to everybody and just see what happens. In my mind, that was the, the best decision that was made in, in terms of starting the column in that way. I also promised myself that I would respond to everybody who submits, so there's a sense of trust that if you send in the most important story of your life, it won't just wind up in the dustbin and you won't get any response. Uh, so I, I hope that, that that created an environment where people felt comfortable sending in um, what is often just remarkable work and remarkably intimate work. What would you say makes a modern love column work? It's a tone of, of having uh, been through the ringer and learn something from it and live to tell about it. And that kind of humbled tone works well in a personal essay. And one thing I've learned in editing this column is how, is, is to appreciate a powerful story simply told rather than a small story elegantly told. You also talk about being sure and that kind of ties in that this sense that someone has to feel sure and that right. often they abandon something because they don't. Uh, what I see almost more than anything else is how damaging our fantasies about relationships can be. And we particularly have a fantasy about, um, so, uh, about what a soulmate is and that this person is going to get us on a very deep level and that we're going to meet them and then that's going to be the person for us and that we're then going to have lifelong passion and sex and that's what life is about. But I think when you're looking for someone at the beginning of a relationship and you put that label on them, it can be smothering. <laughs> you're, you're, people think, you know, well, how can someone who I'm meant to be with misread me that badly? I must not be meant to be with this person. And you see that kind of fantasy play out and destroy relationships over and over and over. What's reinforcing it? Is it also something very human that people have this idea? Yeah, I think it's. I think it's all. I think it's all that's left in relationships. You know, it used to be we used to get together for practical, all kinds of practical reasons, and we don't anymore. We only the only reason to get together with someone is if they're perfect for you, and that's hard. <laughs> and the only reason to stay with that person, other than inertia or children or responsibilities is because you continue to, to want to be with them. What is your takeaway about how relationships have changed because of whether it's Facebook or tweets or email? Mm -hmm. or There's something that's very tantalizing about the, the depth of connection that can be had online. And who knows if that isn't uh, the future of that kind of connection. Um, but I... I what, what I see is how people try to turn that kind of relationship into a, into a physical relationship because it feels like this has got to be right. Like I'm so connected to this person. I go to sleep on Skype connected to them and I wake up on Skype connected to them. We talk about everything. And it's interesting how those fail then when the person finally thinks, okay, well, I know he lives in Kansas and I live in New York, but this has got to be it and I'm going to go there. And so then they go and they meet and it doesn't work, and even if they've known each other for six months or a year or whatever it's been, and why doesn't it work? And, and in some cases, it's because you're not the same person when you write about yourself. I'm not the same person on the page as I am speaking to you now, and you create a persona for yourself, and then when you're actually there, you're, you're, not, you're not that persona. You're, you're exposed. How do you cultivate the, 
the ability to be vulnerable to the whole world, essentially, to share your most intimate thoughts with everyone? Or is there something that all of these writers have in common that they have this ability to sort of be an open book internationally? I've gotten a lot of submissions by people who aren't writers at all, but they were inspired by what they'd read in the column. They felt they had an important story to tell, and they told it. Um, granted, with, with some of these stories, uh, I can do a fair amount of work on them um, to help, help them be told, or I'll feel that a piece is missing from the story, and I'll say, well, I'll interview them. I mean, most of my conversations with writers are interviews. Well, tell me more about this, and tell me more about that, and how'd you feel about this and that. I feel like a therapist sometimes with how probing and uncomfortable my questions can make people. But it can lead to really rich, rich material. And there's something f for a storyteller that's very empowering about being able to get their story out there and have people respond to it and to change minds and to move people. Um, and there are a lot of people who want to do that. I'm going to give away your last line of the book because I loved it. He said, let's make sure we step back every so often with humility to marvel at the mystery of what love does best. It helps us to be good. So thank you. Thank you. <laughs>